75 years ago today, fighter planes took off from this airfield to take part in the most famous air battle of all time. It was to be one of the most decisive moments of the war and it changed the course of history. In the next hour, 34 Spitfires and Hurricanes will be taken to the skies in the biggest fly past a Battle of Britain aircraft since World War II. It promises to be a truly spectacular event with some very special guests and a fitting tribute to the few. Welcome to the Battle of Britain, Return of the Spitfires. Welcome to Goodwood Aerodrome in West Sussex. Over the next hour, we are going to be bringing you exclusive coverage of an unprecedented event. Over 30 of these magnificent aircraft are going to be taken off and spreading out across southern England in the most epic Battle of Britain fly past ever. Planes have been flying here from all over the world to take part, and four of these Spitfires have two seats carrying some very important passengers. I'm delighted to say in the rain, one of them's joined me now, Prince Harry. How are you? Well? Oh, God, how are you feeling? Because obviously you're used to flying the modern aircraft. I know you've, you've, you've got some experience of the Spitfire, but you must be so excited. I'm a rotary wing pilot, or was, not fixed wing. <laughs> oh, okay. No, I'm, I'm unbelievably nervous. And you're a huge Spitfire fan, aren't you? Huge Spitfire fan. Who isn't? Yeah. <laughs> they, I mean, what is it about them? Because it's, it's the lines, obviously, it's the it's the debt the country owes it. it. You know, it's. I think it's everything about it. Once you jump into that aircraft, if you're lucky enough to be in it, you you seem to fit the aircraft. You become one with it, and it's like being in a computer game. You know, those in those days there was no training. It was there's the there's the manual. Go and sit in it for, for a couple of hours, and off you go. Yeah. And that, to me, from the training that we have to do, is is remarkable. And and some, yeah, the technology in that thing is, is is quite something else. You've been in it as well. How, how I mean, you know, I've had the good fortune to. Yeah. How was it as a pilot? How is it to go in in that aircraft? Um, just, it, it's unbelievably basic. I mean, it, it was always designed, uh, my understanding is that so that anybody could jump in it and, and fly it with confidence. But I, I just sat in there and was just, just in awe with, as I said, with the fact that you fit into it, um, the noise, the vibrations, everything. It's just, it's boys with toys. It's, it's, <laughs> it's that exactly excitement is, of just sitting there. But then you, then, you, then you take yourself back and think, what must it have been like for those guys breaking up through the cloud cover up into sort of God's playground and, you know, off, off you go. And your, it's your birthday today. Yes, it is. Happy birthday. What a present. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I'm unbelievably fortunate and lucky to, to, to be here. Well, listen, thank you. I know we're going to be talking to you a lot about the Endeavour Fund later on, so thank you very much for now. Now, getting 34, 75-year-old antique planes from all around the world safely in the air, flying within feet of each other above southern England, is a logistical nightmare. Add to the mix a 95-year-old veteran and fifth in line to the throne, and you realise for the man in charge of putting it all together, there is no room for error. That man is squadron leader Dunk Mason. Take a look. Today, we're going to let the aircraft um, do the talking, and we're going to make sure that the sight and the sound of them uh, reminds people of what those 2,500 young men did for the country uh, all those years ago. Poignantly, uh, the amount of aeroplanes that we're launching today, uh, 75 years ago on the 15th of September, uh, the RAF lost around about the same number of aircraft. We're launching the same number of aircraft that were shot down uh, all those years ago. The aim of this is to allow as much of the population to see this incredible fly past as possible. In case you're sat there wondering who your formation leader is, this is the lineup. So I'm going to lead uh, red section. Purple is Rats, pink is Goaty, brown is Dan Griffiths, and uh, uh, black is Doddy. I think it's quite a nice uh, collection of almost uh, 1940s uh, uh, names that we've got there. I've been told by air traffic that the, although we've had such a lot of rain and there is some standing water at the moment, by 12 o'clock they've already walked the ground, so the runway is fit for us to launch and recover the aircraft. OK, the loser plan. If you do have uh, an oak or blimey and you lose your engine, you've got a very, very short period of time where you can left turn into here, but that's not pretty. If you, if you anything, you're going to turn it right and whiz off up this way over Chichester. It's a momentous day, everyone. Uh, there's no doubt that um, it's a privilege for me to be stood up here in front of, uh, of all of you distinguished aviators uh, to lead this. I know that you all feel the same to be involved in this, uh, this incredible day. Um, let's just get out there. We'll put on a good show for the public and just make sure we do it safely. 
Uh, now, that was earlier, and the first time all the pilots had met each other, but it's time to meet the mastermind. You can call him that behind this outrageously ambitious event, Matt Jones from the Boltby Flight Academy. Matt, this is basically um, your baby, isn't it? What on earth were you thinking? Are you thinking that now? What on earth am I thinking? Yeah, there's an element of that as we look at the weather today, I must say, but it's going to clear later, I'm quite sure, so we should, we should be OK. You've got a 95-year-old veteran. You've got fifth in line to the English front. They are flying feet away from each other, aren't they? I mean, it's, it's you know, when you, first, when you first came up with the idea, did you... Did, did you think today was ever going to happen? No, it's taken quite a lot to get all the aeroplanes here, but all the owners have been very, very positive about it because by the nature of owning one of these aeroplanes, you can only be interested in the history. They're, they're, very, they're very different planes, aren't they? So quite a lot can go wrong when you're taxing and boiling the engine and so forth, right? Yeah, there are, there are lots of little idiosyncrasies with each type. Um, essentially, they're the same, but the, the smaller aeroplanes had much smaller radiators, so you have to worry about them overheating. Um, as, they, uh, as they suffered those problems during the war, they made the, uh, they made the changes very quickly. So by the time they got to the Mark 9, they had two ra radiators, and suddenly the overheating issue had kind of gone away. OK, so, so you're thinking just, everything's going to go just fine today, yeah? Everything's going to go just fine. How excited are you today? You must I'm massively, be so excited. massively excited. I don't think it'll really dawn on me until it's all over and everyone's back down on the ground. But just walking around here at Goodwood and seeing all these aeroplanes here, you know, it is a phenomenal sight. Yeah. And for, for, for all of us who are all so passionate about them, it, it means a lot. All right. Good luck, buddy. Thanks very much. Take care, mate. Thanks a lot. See you. We are going to give you a front row seat to this spectacular event today. We've got cameras on the south coast. Look at those pictures. Those, they're, they're coming in from a helicopter just off Beachy Head. You can see the rain in the distance. That's where we are. Hopefully some of that fine weather's come our way. Uh, back with Prince Harry now. Still in the rain. Um, how did the briefing go? I mean, do you, you're a passenger today, aren't you? So can, I am you, passenger. can you sort of relax in that, or do you? I got, when, I, when I got given a map and a comms card, that's, then, then it was that point I was like, hang on, bleh, maybe I should concentrate. Just, <laughs> just in case John actually sort of has a heart attack or something and I actually have to you know, man the control. Well, that's the thing, when I went up, Matt, uh, my pilot, was just telling me, just that he, he started giving me all this information about bailing out, and I just, it was that moment that hit me, I thought, oh, hang on a second, it's not a fair car <laughs> ride, is it? I might have to do something here. I think that's the only thing you need to, need to know is how to, how to open, open the door as such and, uh, and jump out and, and where to pull your shoe. Yeah, Apart which, from that, it which should be all there. responsibility. Simple, but actually, yeah. Surely. You are from a family of aviators, aren't you? Your grandfather in particular, was, uh, he, he, yes. he learned to fly, didn't he? Yeah, you? my grandfather, my father and my brother, most of them flew for the RAF, so, I mean, it's not flying as such, you know what I mean? It's compared so, to the just, army. So, so there's, a, is there a, there's a rivalry between if you're flying for the army and flying for the army? No, the, 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 I think there's always a bit of a rivalry, but on, on today, um, I am humbled. I was going to say, if you're an army boy, do you have to keep your head down today I and just like do what you're told to? I have to keep my head down. Obviously, you fly, you know, state-of-the-art air, uh, aircraft. The, 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 you must have so much admiration for these chaps uh, having to go to war in, yes, an incredibly beautiful aircraft, but um, something, something that, you know, is a tin can and a machine gun, you know? I can't bring myself to even comprehend what they must have gone through. Um, knowing, knowing that they had, had, had as much warning as they had, with uh, more and more aircraft taking off, taking off, taking off, and then, and then getting that, 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 that phone call saying, right, scramble, off you go, lads. And not really knowing what you're going to be confronted with. Yeah. You know, different weather conditions, different hype box that you're fighting in. Everything that you know, these, these things are just full of fuel as well, yeah. And a couple of rounds in the wrong place, and Absolutely. that's it, you're gone. I, yeah, um, I take my hat off to them. Can we talk about the uh, the Endeavour Fund and, and Spitfire yeah. Scholarship? Yeah. How did that come about? How did using the Endeavour Fund translate into the Spitfire Scholarship? Oh, that's um, the, Endeavour, the, sh the short story. <laughs> the, the, sorry, the short story. Well, the Endeavour Fund was always sort of a, a, an idea of ours to try and create as many opportunities for. Um, ex-servicemen or wounded servicemen to give them a chance to basically get their life back on track mm. essentially um, to set themselves a task or a challenge and complete that task or challenge to prove to themselves and, and maybe other people but mainly prove to themselves that you know life in some cases has only just begun yeah. um, and as you're as, as, as we'll hear from, from Nathan and Alan they've had an opportunity um, to, to be able to fly a whole stream of aircraft over over the last year and a bit, I think, and now you know now they they've had the chance to fly a Spitfire. Um, yes, some people can walk to the North Pole, some people walk to the South Pole, climb Everest, or fly a Spitfire. But it doesn't matter what your challenge is; mm -hmm. everyone has their own Everest. Yeah. And for these guys, that may just be walking a mile down the road with their kids to school. And what, but whatever the challenge is, whatever the challenge that they, they they want for the Endeavour Fund, if we can produce provide that, and find people like these guys 
who can almost showcase their, their, their ability to the other ones. Yeah. And it's, it's those guys that we don't hear about. It's those guys that are stuck in, in, in their house, major anxiety, who can't or don't have the opportunity to do this, that these guys will be the, be the ambassadors Shiga, for that yeah. and be able to draw them out of, sure. out of those dark holes. Okay. And that's, that's what it's all about. Really. Great, we'll catch up with you later. Thank you. Now, this airfield is known as Goodwood Aerodrome today, but it used to be called RAF West Hampton. Back in the Battle of Britain, it was one of the critical air bases involved on this day 75 years ago, but it looked very different back then. Uh, with me now to put this whole event into historical context is Second World War historian James Holland. James, welcome. How different would this airfield look uh, 75 years ago? Oh, well, basically, it would have just been a large 100-acre grass field. Uh, and that's a bit, hardly no, no hangers, nothing. It was pretty basic. And, and as a day, I know we've touched on this before, but how significant is this? Oh, it's really important. There's two major raids over London, another one over further west, and uh, this is a day of, a, of really major air battles, which lots of people on the ground were looking up and seeing. Uh, now, every one of these planes has a story and how it got here and its history, but I know you've picked out just a couple for us, haven't you? What, what do you want, I mean, we're going to touch on some later on, but what do you want to talk about right now? Well, there's one particular hurricane I think is pretty special, so R4118, and, uh, and this was a Battle of Britain veteran. Flew 40, 49 uh, operations in the Battle of Britain, uh, but ended up at the end of the war in, in India, and then was left, and it was uh, found, discovered in 1981, by a chap called Peter Vasher, just rotting in this Just courtyard. by accident? He just found it by accident? Just by accident. And he thought, God, you know, this is, I can't leave this like this. I've got to do something about it. So he spent years and years and years trying to get it. Eventually got it back in 2001, a 13-year painstaking uh, restoration, and finally it's it. But the interesting thing about it is it actually shot down five aircraft, enemy aircraft, in the Battle of Britain. So it's an ace in its own right. It's incredible it's going to fly today as well. Amazing. Uh, anyone else? Which other...? Yes, well, there's a number of Mark 9s here, and the Mark 9s have some good stories with them. And uh, one of the things they did post D-Day, after the Normandy invasion, was they had these... Uh, some of them were equipped with um, little things underneath the uh, uh, underside of the plane that you could attach extra fuel tanks. Uh, and their interpretation of fuel was a little bit loose, because what they decided is what the fuel was really needed was some beer for the boys over Just in... Just put over the beer Normandy. over there, that's fantastic. So they put them in a beer cake. But you had to have them... Uh, there had to be a sort of official designation for anything that was going across, so they called it Joy Juice Triple. <laughs> All right, almost there. 34 planes, 34 Rolls Royce engines, 34 nervous pilots, one 95 year old Battle of Britain hero, and one very important member of the Royal Family. All about to take off on the biggest gathering of World War II aircraft assembled since the war. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back. Spitfires and hurricanes from all around the world are about to take off and form the biggest fly past the Battle of Britain aircraft ever seen since the war. So exciting. Any second, 36 planes will begin their formation flights across the south of England for this incredible tribute. Prince Harry and the man who can literally say he's been there and done that, 95-year-old war veteran Tom Neal, are raring to go. That's him in the rear seat taxiing out. Uh, and there is Prince Harry now going through the crucial then, final uh, flight briefing you know in the hangar with his down team. Down How is he feeling right uh, now? Uh, right now, uh, very excited to get closer. Uh, back with James to give us more historical context on the day. Uh, James, we can see the map table here. I know that nine routes of these planes are about to take. Can you give us just a little encapsulation of the historical context of a couple yeah, of Yeah, of course. Places? Well, I mean, the Battle of Britain took place all over England, but most of it took place here in the south and southeast. And so that's where the idea is that anyone who's on the ground in that area is going to see a Spitfire at some point today. Right. And that's just fantastic. So they're going to go all along the south coast here, uh, um, over the Isle of Wight, up to Biggin Hill here. This is a very important key crucial airfield in the Battle of Britain. Had a very, very busy day on the 15th of September 1940. Up to North Wheel, that's where Tom Neal was with 249 Squadron. And then Duxford, that's the, uh, the Duxford wing, led by the legless ace Douglas Bader. Great. And I know we've got, uh, I think we've got some chopper shots over the southeast as well, so we should have some really great shots there. Thanks, uh, James. More from you later on. All right, 34 priceless vintage aircraft are about to take to the skies, but the real star today is this man, a 95-year-old RAF ace, Wing Commander Tom Neal, who flew more than 141 missions in the Battle of Britain right now, getting ready to fly. I met with him earlier to see how he felt flying a Spitfire again for the first time in 50 years. 
So, Tom, you haven't flown a Spitfire since 50 years? 50 years is long. It's one of these things, too. Yes. How are you feeling about going up uh, today? No, well, I don't bend too much in the middle, and uh, it's going to be difficult, but I'll have a go. Mm -hmm. But it's the getting out bit, because I'd probably have to be winched out with a crane, yeah. which I don't want to do. This time, 75 years ago, how were you feeling then? What was going through your mind on uh, and, and the morning of the, of the 15th? Morning of the 15th? Well, the 15th was a rather special day. We knew what was happening, and I think I flew four times that day, and uh, with some success. How many planes did you shoot down? There was one dawn here, and then two are credited to me, which I didn't know I shot down. <laughs> and a third dawn here, which... Uh, hit the sea out of uh, North Foreland. In retrospect, what memory will you take or have you taken from that day? Really, it was a matter of confusion. You didn't really know what was happening. The people at the sharp end of a fight didn't know least about what was happening. So it's just, it was just chaos absolutely, everywhere? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Please understand the adulation we feel we need to give you. Good luck today. You're, you're too kind. Um, you're too kind. Best of luck. I hope, you, I hope it's more than tolerable. I hope you enjoy it. Oh, well, you shall see. <laughs> Providing I can get in it. OK. Fingers crossed. Thank you, Tom. Bye-bye. Now, these iconic planes have come from all over the world to be here today. Uh, one over there comes from Seattle, Washington. Uh, we have some shots of it now, I think, flying beautifully over the Cascade Mountains. Uh, but James, there's some great stories about colour schemes as well, right? Yeah, we've got uh, one photo of a reconnaissance plane. Back in the day, it was, uh, it was, was pink. There's a whole squadron done with these. How come? Why? Well, they just thought it was a good idea to trial it at sunset and at sunrise, and they thought it would be a good camouflage scheme. Wow, wow. What's, what's, what? Well, what is that? To get any, any planes in the air requires just an unbelievable amount of time and dedication. And do you know what that is? I don't know what that is. Okay, that is a rivet. And this was given to Martin Phillips. May I? Yeah, of course. Thanks. Martin Phillips was challenged by his friend. He said, if I give you this rivet, I bet you can't make a, a Spitfire with that as your starting point. So his friend just given that? Exactly. Exactly that. And he thought, right, I'm going to show you. So he spent 13 years scouring the country, scouring the world, trying to find stuff. He found a, a wing at the bottom end of a garden in a pub. He found the fuselage just, uh, just not very close, not very far from here. Uh, and that's where it gets its cereal from. And after all this time, a million pounds, 13 years in the making, this is the end. This is it? It's absolutely amazing, isn't it? It's beautiful. It's the most expensive and longest pub bet of all time. Incredible. <laughs> great. All right, thanks so much, James. Getting excited? Calm yourself. Uh, <laughs> Prince Harry is just now a few minutes away from takeoff. As we touched upon earlier, he's been heavily involved in this event right from the off through his Endeavour Fund. He set up a scholarship scheme designed to give wounded veterans a chance to, uh, to learn how to fly a Spitfire. Take a look. Spitfire scholarship trainees Nathan Forster and Alan Robinson have both been through life changing injuries. Ex-paratrooper Nathan was blown up by an IED in Afghanistan in 2011. An IED explosion is not really like the movies. It's a loud pop. You don't really hear the, the, the force of the blast. A lot of shrapnel went through my lower leg, um, right buttock, upper back. I had a bit of shrapnel missed my spine by three millimetres. So that would have been paralysed from the neck down. So I said I was, there was someone looking after me that day. I was, I was very, very lucky. RAF mechanic Alan lost his right leg in a motorbike crash in the UK in 2011. When the paramedic said, actually, this is really bad, I was a bit sort of, hmm, OK. When I looked down and I saw, you know, there was no thoughts, I, I really didn't, didn't know how, how much of the leg I'd lost. For both, the Spitfire scholarships have given them a fresh chance in life. Over the past 18 months, they've learned to fly the chipmunk and then moved on to the faster and more complicated Harvard. With the ultimate goal to fly the thoroughbred of the skies and become fully qualified Spitfire pilots. 
It's a similar training plan as the Battle of Britain fighter aces went through in the 1940s. For me, this scholarship is a childhood dream. One of the good things to come out of, you know, what's happened to me is, is this, and, you know, it's, it's just sort of a massive light at the end of the tunnel. They're joined now by Harry, Nathan and Alan. How does that make you feel when you see these guys, you know, nailing it and getting up there? You must be very proud. Oh, like a proud dad. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm thrilled to bits that they've, they've managed to, to last the distance so far and, and the fact that they've actually been enjoying it. I mean, um, Nathan's now, he's, he's, he's working down here, yeah. so he has to put up with all these pilots on a day-to-day -day basis, whereas, uh, whereas Alan's still serving in the RAF, so comes down on weekends. So it's two completely different situations, but hopefully, rather than them turning around going, what have you done to us? It's more, <laughs> it's more a case of, you know, this is, this is a fantastic experience. Well, that's the thing, because I say on paper, Everyone would look at this and go, what an incredible opportunity. But knowing the amount of information you guys have to assimilate in such a short period of time and how concentrated that is, it's, it's not easy, this. No, it's been a very steep learning curve, but it's, uh, I suppose it's, it's been the 75th anniversary today. It's um, allowed a sort of unique perspective on, on what the guys went through. It's been nearly a year now since we really started training and uh, those guys were doing it in, Six months. Alan, how's it been for you? Obviously, you're still serving and you live a fair way away, don't you? It's a big commitment. Yeah, it's been a, a huge commitment for me. Um, but luckily, you know, my, my wife and my family have been amazing, really. So they've, they've been really supportive and, and that's, that's helped me a lot. It, it's, it's, it's an amazing, amazing thing to be a part of, really. It's, it's just a special place down here, isn't it? As soon as you're here, you feel, yeah, you, know, you can just drink it in, can't you? Yeah, I mean, you know, being uh, surrounded by, you know, these beautiful aeroplanes, it's, it's, um, it's, it's a little bit surreal, really. Yeah. You know, I'm, you know, just an ordinary guy given, given uh, a, an extraordinary uh, opportunity, really. You're no ordinary guy. OK, <laughs> um, listen, now the fun bit. Uh, Nathan had, well, quite a week, an incredible moment last week, didn't you? you, you was this your first solo flight or your first, uh, first, your first flight? Seat. Well, you were essentially flying. Yeah, yeah, first front seat tri uh, trip in the spin. So in the front seat, you're in charge. Yeah, yeah. OK. Uh, do you want to see it? Yeah. <laughs> right, let's take a look. OK, so this is you taking off. How was that? What, what, what a feeling when you take off. How was that? It was incredible. I was, I was, I was holding up the back of the aeroplane then. It was, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it throws you back in the seat and it's just, it's one to get airborne. Yeah. A paratroop flying in everything. <laughs> <laughs> what was going on? <laughs> and what a great day for it as well. Now, listen, this is what I want to talk us through. Here's the landing. Um, look at that, beautiful, look at it. Uh, is he landed? Yet? Oh, no, no. Is he still, still going? Just up there and he's still flying. I think you probably mark it down as three, maybe four landings. Yeah. <laughs> now, listen, I want to preface this by uh, our historian, James Holland, saying that it's, it took several Battle of Britain veterans ten times to land before they got signed off. Uh, so it was that was an incredible thing. However... <laughs> There was a lot of that going on there, buddy. Hopefully that's three, three out of the ten. <laughs> <laughs> what, do, uh, what do we make of the landing, chaps? Over to you. What do you think? I've, no, I've never even tried to land a uh, Spitfire, and it's the, the, certainly the guys I've spoken to say it's damn hard. Is that the toughest bit? Yeah, it is, definitely. You just can't see a thing out, out in front. In the air, it's beautiful, but when you have to come there, back on the ground, it's, it's hard work. So you bang on about how beautiful it is. It kind of made it easier to land. It's easier to jump out of a plane, isn't it? Yeah, a lot easier. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right, listen, guys, we're going to leave you. Uh, thank you so much. We're going to leave you to get ready uh, with all the planes for the flight today. OK, it's been a pleasure talking to all of you. Thank you very much. OK, it's the moment of truth. Time for the main event. 34 planes, the biggest collection of Battle of Britain aircraft ever assembled since the war, are about to take off on this absolutely epic 75th anniversary tribute flight. We'll see you after the break. Uh, welcome back to Gilbert and listen to that. Oh, that is. He oh, hello, you! Oh, that is heaven. That is the awesome sound of 34 Merlin engines all firing up, ready to go. We're about to witness this truly spectacular sight of 34 Spitfire Americans taking to the skies to 
pay tribute to those who fought in what became known as Battle of Britain Day exactly 75 years ago. Leading the way, the true VIP of today, war veteran Tom Neal. So, with a hurricane starting up in the background, which, by the way, is very exciting, um, as we understand it, uh, Prince Harry Spitfire uh, hasn't started, and so he's given his seat up to Nathan. What, uh, on his birthday as well? Yeah, and it just underlines, you know, these are very complex machines. Um, they're old, and, you know, even back in the day, back in 1940, pilots would not be going up if there was something wrong with, their, with, with the plane. I mean, that, that helps absolutely no one. But on the other hand, you know, the sun is out, the sun, Merlins are roaring, and um, there's a lot to be convinced about. What, yeah, absolutely. But what, I mean... You know, you, you have to feel for the guy that on his birthday oh, it's devastating. he's sat there devastating. in the plane and it doesn't start. Um, well, let's hope he gets another opportunity. Well, another I'm sure time. he will. And, and what a good thing to do, giving his seat up for Nathan as well. Spitfire that flew in the Battle of Britain, and I, I can't tell you what oh, it is Tom to Neil's see that. There's Tom Neal. Oh, God, what must I be thinking? This is as close as you're ever going to get to re recreating a scramble during the Battle of Britain. The sun is out, and here they go. This is just a unique event. This is living history. It's, Can I it's... ask? You, you had dinner with Tom last night. How is he, how's he feeling about this flight? How is he... What were his emotions? <laughs> he's a he's an extraordinary phlegmatic fellow, so I think he is pretty excited. I'm sure he is, but you know he keeps it all to himself. But look you know, at that! The sound, isn't it? It is. Let's start, the, when you're in the Spitfire, it really hits you. But when you're down here and you hear all the engines roaring, it's just something so special about that. Isn't it? Look at that! I love it. But what I can't get over is, is you're seeing the equivalent of three squadrons mm -hmm. taking off from a Battle of Britain airfield. If you want to cast your mind back to those days 75 years ago, look out there, that's what it was like. Planes taking off to the, into the sky, young men piloting them, undercarriages going up, disappearing. Will they come back? Who knows? It's, uh, oh, it's emotionally charged. It's a different feeling. A sigh of another Merlin, just about to start up. But it's interesting, you know, back in the day, on the, on the 15th of September 1940, 602 Squadron were operating from here, and they took off in the afternoon, and. What's interesting is they, they, because back then you'd have radio sets in, obviously in your, in your headphones. You'd have headphones in your fly helmet, yeah. leather skull helmet, and you'd have a ground controller. The ground controller would be telling you what to do and where to go. So in this case, 602 Squadron would have taken off in the afternoon, about 2.30 in the afternoon on the 15th of September from this, and gone, just taken off along the grass stretch in exactly the same way they have this afternoon. And then the squadron leader would hear instructions in his red set, and he'd hear, um, hello, Villa leader, that's the call sign for 602 squadron. Uh -huh. uh, it would go vector 020, something like that, because I think they were sent up towards sort of Brooklyn's area. Um, and it would say angels 20. Angels means thousands of feet. So that would be 20,000 feet, so climb to 20,000 feet. Buster. Buster means full speed ahead. Um, and then they might get some information about the enemy, so bandits um, over Biggin or something yeah, like yeah. that. That would tell you roughly where they were going to be. So these were all words that over the crackle of your headset you would be able to hear very, very good. What I find extraordinary is just how much they have to think about how, and, and at the same time how much their bodies have to go through. They really do go through the mill to get to this point. And, you know, of course, it's worth it. I mean, the, the, luck, the privilege of flying one of these planes, and here they come oh, over us right now. Doug Mason leading. Lovely. So this is um, this is our four one one eight just about to take off, and this is the other veteran we've got from the Battle of Britain. Flew 49 times in the Battle of Britain. Right, so Shot down to do yeah. yeah. So an ace in its own right, Dermot. Now, these iconic planes uh, obviously hold a very special place in the affection of our nation, especially this chap. <laughs> uh, but for some of those actually flew them. Uh, the emotional bomb was uh, formed 75 years ago. On Sunday night, we heard the story of the Air Transport Auxiliary, the men and women who provided the crucial service that delivered planes to the factories and airfields across Britain. One of them 
Mary Ellis had a very spe uh, special connection to one of the Spitfires about to take off. I flew a Spitfire into Bryce Norton. I parked it, and whilst I was waiting for the taxi plane, which was coming, I signed my name in this uh, Spitfire. Obviously, I was young and uh, very romantic, <laughs> and I thought sometimes some handsome a fighter pilot will see my name, he will get in touch with me, and it will be the beginning of a delightful friendship. It was the only aeroplane I ever signed my name in. I don't know whether my name is still in it. I would love, I simply would love to see it again. Uh, that was Mary Ellis, and earlier on, we did reunite her with that plane. Take a look. Oh, Mary, it is certainly still flying, and you're, as are you, you're with us. We're almost taking off right now, aren't we? <laughs> How does it feel to see your old plane again? Oh, it's excellent. It, it's out of this world, really. Yeah, I know you've scribbled, you've defaced, graffitied uh, this plane, uh, and, um, and we are going to see... <laughs> we've got our cameraman on the wing, so we can take a look. We get in there, and there we go. going to take the monitor. And we can just see, I think, there we are. Look, you can just see at the top there. Can you see it? Oh, yes. Your name. Yes, that's right. Defacing and graffitiing. <laughs> <laughs> Did you end up with a pilot? I didn't meet anyone oh. just at that time. But did you, did you end up with a pilot in the end? I did, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, listen, when we first met, you flew in the Spitfire a couple of weeks ago. Yes. How was that? That was fantastic. It really was wizard. Yeah. I was so happy to be in the Spitfire again. Well, and you looked at ho you looked so at home in the Spitfire. I mean, you know, and I know I was talking to Matt, who you flew with you, and he said that, you know, you were in complete control. You knew where everything was. You enjoyed it. Did, is it like riding a bike? Did it all come back naturally? Yes, it is more or less. <laughs> when you're in an aeroplane, you have to think about the weather. When you're on a bicycle, it really doesn't matter. <laughs> And on this sort of very special day, um, what are your thoughts? It's so wonderful. It really is to be back in this atmosphere with all these lovely Spitfires. Oh, I, I only flew 400, so I was just getting used to them. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, only 400. We're all a bit disappointed by that, Mary. <laughs> Listen, it's so lovely to have you with us, and thank you so much. Appreciate it. So uh, we're seeing someone there uh, on the tail, obviously to keep the, to keep the weight down. Um, this would have happened often. Yeah, and actually, there's a great story from a plane that actually flew from here, RAF West Hampton, uh, and that was in early 1945. And there was a WAF. By that stage, we had female fitters and riggers and ground crew, uh -huh. and uh, there was a WAF called Margaret Horton, and she was doing exactly that. And uh, the, the pilot Neil Cox, DFC, taxied out. Got ready to take off, forgot she was there. So gun the throttle. Wait, would, she, would she not have just jumped off? Well, no, because it's moving and it's kind of... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, but maybe he, she assumed that he was going to. But anyway, so they took off and suddenly he sort of looked up at his mirror, could see this whack holding on for dear life. So had to circuit around the airfield, land back down again. And, um, and she was all right, she was safe, thank goodness. But apparently the rumour that she got fined for losing her beret. <laughs> that is hilarious. She should honestly have a medal for something like that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Sorry, what did you want to say about the blending? Well, the blending is really great that we're seeing that there because, of course, Battle of Britain is all about fighter command, RF fighter command, but there were three commands in the RAF. There was coastal command mm -hmm. and bomber command, and the Blenheim fought with all three. Really interesting. It was a, as, a, a, as a fighter as well as a bomber. Yeah, they're well trained, but they've got a lot to worry about that's going on in the cockpit. And then actually, the physical impact it has on their bodies just flying this plane. The courage of these young men, you really cannot overstate it. It's just phenomenal. 
That is a spectacular sight. Join us after the break. In a moment, we'll be getting our first air-to-air -air shot to this epic fly past, and we'll see the Battle of Britain veteran Tom Neal in his cockpit as he flies over the south coast. Incredible. Uh, and getting all the reaction as he lands. And we'll be hearing again from Prince Harry. You'll see this soon. Uh, welcome back. We've just seen the last plane leave. I'm joined now by uh, Prince Harry, who should be happy and should also be a bit sad, I suppose. Um, firstly, how did you feel watching that? Um, unbelievably left out. <laughs> 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 no, it was it was really really emotional. It's bizarre. Like, the the noise of every aircraft sounds completely different, but every single one of them, the vibrations end up sort of running through your blood. Um, of course, I'm only 31 years old, and if I can feel that. You know, God knows what everybody else, you know, above this age of 75 or 80. So listen, what happened? We spoke this morning in pouring rain, and you were going to go up, and you were excited about it. And, and what, so what went wrong? Um, that the aircraft in Biggin Hill decided to pack it up, and um, and then for Nathan or or Alan were going to be one of them was going to have to to lose out. So I think it just made sense that, bearing in mind the day with obviously Tom flying, and the Endeavour Fun piece with those guys, it just made sense for the three of them to. To, to, to fly together and, um, and for me to sit here by myself. It's a lovely moment. What were you And get thinking? dragged into talking to you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's the worst bit about it. Oh, thanks a much. Thanks a bunch. <laughs> no, it, it, you know, it's weird how things work out and um, it's just the way it is. You know, Matt's been very kind and said, look, whenever you want to come down and, and go for a fly, I was like, yes, that would be fantastic. Yeah. But, I, you know, I had, I've had a chance to fly and I would have loved to have flown next to Tom and, and seen his face. But the beauty of this is I get to, to stay here and watch him come in and then run up and, and, and see his initial reaction of when he moment. touched the ground. So. And we are back with Tom now, and I'm back with James as well. Oh, James, look at that size, isn't that spectacular? Just amazing. It sort of reminds me of what, of what it must have looked like in July 9th. Oh, look at that shot. Yeah, that's great, isn't it? There's the, uh, the Mark II with Dunk Mason flying. It's when you contextualise it. That's, uh, uh, that's Tom that's on the that's left, Tom, isn't it? Yep. Yep. It's when you contextualise it, always with when you see land and sea, just those lovely cliffs in the background. Oh, there he is, look. <laughs> That's great. Well, there's definitely a smile on his face. Yeah. Uh, they're heading right now, I believe, over, over the Isle of Wight. I think they'll be going around the Needles very soon, I think. But what you're seeing there, Dermot, is a kind of formation that would have been entirely typical of July 1940, when right. there were sort of little skirmishes out in the channel, uh -huh. um, as the Luftwaffe were attacking channel shipping and stuff. And this sort of size formation, not a full squadron, perhaps a flight, a couple more, you know, sort of eight, that, that is what you would have seen. And, and the formation is pretty, pretty similar as well. I and there's Nathan, a really, really special day here, yeah, Nathan. Amazing, amazing. Look at that. I mean, it's just, it's unbelievable, isn't it? And um, there's Tom again. It's so nice to see the planes in the background as well, isn't it? No, these are really incredible scenes, aren't they? It really is. It's just so sort of emotive, I think. Yeah. Of course. And basically what you've got there is the two two-seaters with Nathan and Tom in and then pretty much the rest of the Battle of Britain Memorial flight, which do just such are. amazing work all summer. They, yeah. And uh, there they are. I think they're heading around the needles about. Yeah, I think that's the needles, isn't it? The other yeah, one is. And all the pilots, they're just, oh, they just they just love it. They are they're such nice guys really dedicated to what they do. You have to work really hard, even if you're in the RAF and get the BBMF job. It's, it's a really hard work flying these planes. Obviously, unbelievably rewarding, particularly on a day like today. But, um, you know, no one does this stuff lightly. Yeah, yeah, of course. And, you know, the one, what's fascinating here is just how close they are together. And we're mm. my eyes probably being a little bit deceived, but... No, I think that's pretty close. They're not that far, are they? <laughs> no. There we are coming over Southampton, which, of course, is where... The Spitfire was born, yeah, Super Marine, Marine yeah. had their, their factory down at Woolston. And um, Southampton has a big, big association with the Spitfire. So very appropriate there, flying over there. Tom gives the, the royal wave. <laughs> and well he might. Do you know, the lovely thing that now, you, you just know that um, the people watching down below are pulling over and, and you know, and just... Um, and there we are right oh, now, down by Beachy Head. It's the burning gap there. Over Look at that, the, all uh, the way down the other the other end. The fly past it. Over, it? Beautiful shots. And I'm back with Prince Harry now. Incredible images there. 
What do you think is going through Tom Neal's head right now? For him, it's going back to work. Yeah. You know, that's like being forced back into the office once you've retired. Mm. <laughs> that's, that's the simplest way of, of looking at it. But I'm sure when he gets out, you know, his, his eyes will be, will be, uh, will be welled up. And, and, you know, good for him to, to, to get in the aircraft. And even better for Matt, you know. Matt, who's put this whole thing together, um, to have the honour of flying Tom on a day like today, I mean, how he's going to find the airfield when his eyes are just uh, full of yeah, water, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. Absolutely. Look how many people have turned out. There's 32,000 people or it's something true, here on the hill all across all oh, across the UK. Hello. Spitfires flying overhead. It doesn't get better than this. Can I confirm, is that, is that Tom coming back? Do we know? By all accounts, it is. Wow. Yeah, yeah that's Tom. So that's Tom now. One of the aircraft is uh, John and Nathan, and they should be doing a loop and a barrel roll for us at some point. Oh, fantastic. Okay. That, tell me, tell me, Thomas, Thomas, no, forgotten no, that Tom, pleasure. Tom, that will be Tom there coming in, the lower aircraft. Yes. And these guys should be coming around and doing a couple. We're of We're not doing aerobatics with Tom, though, are we? No, he oh, specifically said don't do aerobatics. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, who doesn't want to fly that's a Spitfire? Come well, on, speaking of it, here's Tom now coming into land. God, that's exciting. Honestly, I've, I've just had, I've had the most well, extraordinary yeah. summer with Tom. I just found out so much about. The, the, the world, how it was then, how, you know, just what he went through. But it was all, it go. was excitement. It was excitement, it wasn't, he said it wasn't there fear, it was just pure excitement of being able to fly that one fantastic machine with all your buddies. What a moment for Wing Commander Tom Neal. There he is in the back. <laughs> really relieved to be down, I'd say. He's not plugged in either, so he hasn't had a chance to speak or listen to anything that Matt has to say. So in that respect, he's probably quite lucky. To be, but fa to be fair, he's probably just endured the hour on his own for yeah. a... Well, like, he, he, refused, he refused to wear a helmet. He said, I don't want anything on my head. I don't care if I can't listen or speak. I just want to, I just want to feel the way that I felt all those, oh, those times ago. Here we go. Oh, Nathan, what a day! <laughs> oh, you little beauty. <laughs> A moment right there, isn't it? Thank you very much, Prince Harry. Now, as you can see, Tom Neal is being wheeled back into the hangar. Let's go and see how this extraordinary experience was for him. So, Tom has just landed. I'm with him now with Matt and Nathan. So, Tom, that must have brought back a few memories for you. How and did you enjoy it? I know you were you, were, you weren't worried, but you weren't exactly looking well, forward to it. Well, I wasn't worried. I'm a perfectly good pilot who I knew was. Brilliant in every respect. Oh, I don't think him up too much. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, the only thing that worried me slightly was uh, I felt a bit of claustrophobic mm -hmm. in the back because I was wearing all my clothes. And then we took off in a perfectly manner, a bit bumpy, much. Mm, yeah, yeah, the ground was lumpy, you know. And then we climbed up, and then the most uh, uncomfortable. Part of the trip was we just flew below low cloud, which you fly not to do in an aircraft because it is naturally bumpy. Mm. And the wind being as it was, and the bumpiness being as it was, it was a little uncomfortable. But it didn't phase my pilot. Matt, it was emotional for you, I know that. It was very emotional for me. I did say, I, when we got out of the cockpit, I did say to, uh, to Tom, that was the, the the greatest honour of my flying life, to be able to fly him, and I promised I wouldn't say it to him again now, but I, now I think I've just said it, so I've ruined that promise. <laughs> but it was. It was uh, an extraordinarily emotional moment. Uh, and What's going through your head when you're up there? Because, you know, you're flying it. But... The first thing is don't hit the other aeroplane. Uh, the second thing is don't hit any of the other aeroplanes around. But the third thing, I was watching Tom in the back. On the, there's a mirror above the cockpit. I didn't realise that. So I said, <laughs> and I, <laughs> And I could see him looking at the, uh, I could see him looking at the other aeroplanes around us. And I can only begin to imagine 
you know, what sort of memories that might have brought back, but that we, I will never understand. And Nathan, where do we start? I mean, yes. firstly, the aerobatics, did you, did you keep it together? Yeah, that was uh, 3G, that was, that was good fun at the end. That was, uh, that was good to beat up the... Yeah, How good. did it feel for you? Just to, I mean, how was the taper for you? How was the whole experience? Uh, it was great, it was just fine in formations. You've got four Spitfires together, then you look into your right, you've got two more Spitfires and a Hurricane, and it was a point where we came around the White Cliffs of Needles on the Isle of Wight. All the shadows just silhouetted against it. through your head then? Oh, that was, just, yeah, it was incredible. It really was something I'll never forget. A final thought from you, Tom? It's been the great days when the, the, the fight in the Spitfire it, in formation, uh, apart from the bumpiness of where we flew, it's brought back a lot of memories. Yeah. But it, it, seeing aircraft in very close formation is, particularly if you haven't seen them for quite some time before, it's quite, uh, quite an emotional business. Thank you. Thank you a great deal. It's been wonderful spending more time with you. And, um, and today is all about commemoration of you and your and your colleagues and your comrades. So thank you yep. very much, Tom. Thank you. So they did it. What an achievement. Over 30 planes in the air, nine separate wings. Absolutely phenomenal. We've come to the end of a very special commemoration. And as the few get fewer, the importance of remembering the heroism and the sacrifice made by the men and women of the RAF on September the 15th, 1940, simply cannot be overplayed. Seeing so many of these iconic aircraft in the air and meeting so many of the veterans who took part 75 years ago was an incredibly humbling experience and one we are honoured to have been part of. We'll leave you now with some of the highlights of this truly fitting anniversary, a tribute to the heroes of the Battle of Britain.